Hello, welcome back to another edition of Chris's instructional videos. Today we're going to be talking about Tales of Arabian Nights. Tales of Arabian Nights is well, arguably my most favourite game. I get to play this all the time with my girlfriend. She loves reading the terrible tales that have befallen me and why she is one. So uh, from a personal standpoint, I think that this is uh, the best game I have in my collection. In reality, it's not strictly a game in the uh, in the sort of true sense of the word, but it's a really, really lovely way to spend an evening with your loved ones. It's a great experience. It's like uh, watching an epic movie, only you are one of the characters in it. It's actually a very basic game to play, so this will not be my standard hour and 15 minute long video. I'll simply show you how to set the board up and literally how a turn will work. So it won't take very long, but it just saves you from reading the rules. <laughs> so if you buy this, you can play it straight after watching this video. So without further ado, let me set it up. I'm only going to set up one player, but you'll get the idea of how the game operates. Okay, so here we have the board laid out. I haven't actually put anything on the board in terms of player pieces yet, but um, we'll go through it and I'll show you actually where on the board things should go. The first port of call will be to take a player board, which is really nice, they're really uh, beautifully made. Everything about this game has the highest possible production, and uh, pick a character. So I've chosen Alibaba of the 40 Thieves fame. Now, Alibaba is the black colour. And you've got tons of stuff here. We've got this little round token, which is just simply here to highlight uh, that we are the black player. We are about Alibaba. You'll notice, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a sort of masculine sign and a feminine sign. And that's because you can <laughs> get sex changed in the game. So you flip it over if you become a woman. Um, you cannot win sex changed, as my girlfriend found out to her peril. And uh, you can win in beast form. And she got very angry in one particular game where I won because she was a wo uh, she was a man <laughs> um, instead of a woman. This is the character standee that you'll get with the game, and that would go in the middle of the board. I've got a little dude from Reaper Miniatures. They're actually pretty cool. I mean, my one is not well painted by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, when they're far away from the eye, they still look pretty cool. So I think that they add a little bit to the game, and uh, if you look on Board Game Geek, there's some good approximations of all of the characters um, out there. You have a number of tokens. These quest tokens won't mean anything for now. You have a destination token, which won't mean anything for now. You have an origin token, which won't mean anything for now. So more importantly, you have destiny, wealth, and story. So to win the game, you need a combination of between, well, 20 points. And that can be split between destiny and wealth. And actually the game comes with the most unnecessary volume of tokens, uh, which are story tokens and destiny tokens, and the idea is you pick a, an amount that is hidden to everyone, so I might pick 12 story and 8 destiny, and then when I get to that score, I will uh, run back to Baghdad and declare myself the winner. To be brutally honest, I house rule quite a lot in this game, so you'll hear some of them. Just play 10 and 10, because ultimately you accrue the points quite evenly anyway, um, and it does away with all of those stupid tokens. So personally, I would just play to 10 and 10. It means you know who's going to win and when, but you don't play this game to have some great strategy and win. If you do, you're probably not going to enjoy the game a great deal. So where do these things go? Well, I'm going to have to pan around a little bit. Over in this corner, so the top left-hand corner, we have the destiny track. So all we do is we put our destiny marker at zero. And as we have encounters, we are going to go through and uh, we're going to go up the destiny track. And essentially what happens along the destiny track, you can see this in writing here, that says plus one encounter die roll and plus two encounter die roll. They're going to be that you meet more wonderful things as you go further into your story. So that's the idea there. So, we put our destiny marker there, over here we have the wealth track, and everyone in the game will start off poor. 
And all wealth does is it lets you move and it determines how far you can move. So I can move a total of the higher of these two numbers, so the number is three, and two of these spaces can be on water. So it's not hugely clear, but as soon as you play the game, it will become apparent. So if you go up to respectable or rich, you can move four and four, arguably the best. Princely and fabulous, you can move tons by sea, but it actually slows you down um, by land. If you go all the way down to beggar, then you are at an increased risk of dying. There are a few encounters that kill you in the game. And uh, quite often, <laughs> if you've been wounded and you're a beggar, you're not doing very well, then you might end up dying. So just be a little wary of that. So my wealth token goes there. Down in the bottom right hand corner, we have the story track. And remember, we said we needed 10 and 10. So we put the story marker on here. And again, you've got some text here. Let me just zoom in and see if we can see what that says. So this one says wealth plus one, maximum respectable. So that means that I can move up the wealth track. And this one says I can choose one talent of any skill, uh, or one talent level skill, uh, which doesn't mean anything to us yet, but we'll come to that in just a second. And finally, I will place my, uh, my piece in the middle of the board in Baghdad. So there I am, I'm all set up, ready to go. Now, we're not quite done. We haven't quite finished with our player board. You'll see here, we've got all these things uh, called available skills. So if I just zoom in, there are lots of skills in the game. Now, if you've seen my Tales of Smirsh uh, video, or not Tales of Smirsh, sorry, Agents of Smirsh video, you'll see that it's a similar sort of idea. This is very much uh, sort of used in both games. So you've got acting and disguise, appearance, bargaining and evaluation, and so on. Now, you're going to be called upon using these skills in the game, and uh, you can pick three at the start of the game. Now, you can pick them randomly, and if you're starting off, I probably would, because you won't know what comes up or whatever. I always tend to uh, roleplay my games. So it's Ali Baba, and he's obviously got stealth and stealing, because uh, he's a, a thief. Bargaining and evaluation goes hand in hand with that because he's obviously uh, got to evaluate what, what goods he's got. And finally I've chosen quick thinking because uh, he's obviously going to get into sticky situations. You might have chosen weapon use or some other uh, stuff like that. So I'm going to have three skills at the start of the game. Like I said, they can either be chosen randomly or they can be chosen... Um, specifically like I have just done um, and those are going to be my starting skills and I can definitely get some more as time goes by if I'm lucky um, if time if I'm unlucky I can actually lose them now the final thing we're not going to use origin origin is for when sometimes things will happen in the game where you have to go back to a certain city so if you get married you have to go visit your wife or husband a lot Destination we're not going to use. They're generally for getting into places of power, which is arguably my all-time favourite bit about this game. So what about these quest markers? Well, we need to draw a quest. We always have a quest in the game, and it just gives you a little bit of a goal. So I've drawn the quest Seek Love. Now, once you complete the quest, you will be able to uh, draw another quest. So, your night train dreams of a woman beyond beauty are now uh, invading your waking thoughts. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, if after an encounter you're in a space with a four or higher terrain gem or city icon, roll one die. Add the number in the gem or city icon, and if you roll less than nine, you must move to a new location. If the uh, total is nine or higher, then you have found your love. So, you get wealth plus three, which is pretty awesome. You become married, which is less awesome. Married is not a good status. You become the vizier, which is pretty cool. And like it says here, you place your origin marker in the nearest city because you have met a girl from that city. So we'll take this origin marker and we'll pop it into a city. So this isn't a particularly good example of a, of a quest. Sometimes they will tell you to take your quest marker and have um, an opposing player put it on certain spaces on the board. Now, the whole point of this game is wandering around the board and having great stories. Um, all the quests do are give you some pretend goal to go for. You don't need to win, or you don't need to complete a quest to win. I uh, played this yesterday and I did not complete a quest and I still won the game. 
So there's no need to do that at all. Um, it just gives you something to aim for, and that's quite nice. So, that's set up. You place all your tokens on the board uh, accordingly. You take a quest, and you take the three um, skills of your choice. Let's go through a game turn. Okay, so our game turn begins with um, Alibaba uh, sitting in Baghdad. Now, if we just zoom ever so slightly up to the wealth track, you can see that as I'm poor, I can move three spaces um, by land or two by sea. And I need to find a place which has a four in it. Now, the numbers in these gems are essentially how how uh, far away how wild it is so if you see down here we've got bantus which is actually quite wild so i'm going to start moving down to bantus because i want to complete my quest and that's literally the main reason you have a quest it gives you somewhere to go rather than just blindly wandering around which is fine and you can do that without any problem whatsoever okay i'm going to go one, two, three, and end my turn in Alexandria. Now you'll notice, well, you probably can't see it quite uh, here, but you'll notice with Alexandria there is a two on the, um, on the city. And there's different city icons, but they mean nothing. They're just cities. It's just depending on where in the world they are. So African cities are silvery, and then... Um, European cities are castly, and Indian cities, I don't know, Angkor Wati, I, I guess, uh, but they're just slightly different. So, on a turn, you move, and then you draw an encounter card. So, I'll place the encounter here. Huh, ironically, that is actually, I promise that was not planned, uh, it's actually the city that I ended up in. There are two types of encounter card. So there's one which has a picture of a city on it, and there is one which does not have a picture of a city on it. Okay, so we've actually got both here. We are only taking one. I'm just showing you the other one uh, as a representation of what it would cons uh, consist of. Now, let's just look at the, the way we resolve a city card, and then I'll come back to the other one. So this is a special one. It means that if I go to Alexandria, later on in my game, I will be able to get a bonus. It just happens to be incredibly dumb luck that I ended up there this turn. So, right at the bottom of this, oh, it doesn't like that, is a number, and it says 22. So, that means that the player to my left is going to have to turn to the Book of Encounters, just like we had in Agents of uh, Smirsh, and start to have a look at what is going on. So let's open up the Book of Encounters and see what uh, is held at 22. So this is the paragraph of 22. Okay, and you can see it's numbered 1 to 12. Basically, we will need to now determine what we've met. Okay, and we do this by considering three things. First, we look at how far up the Destiny Week track we are because we might add numbers based on that. If you remember in my intro, in the setup, I said we add one, sort of part way through the Destiny track, and then later on we'll add two. So we're more likely to end up meeting the Angry Ifrita when we've got this higher Destiny. But we actually started the game, so we have nothing to add with regards to Destiny. Then we look at the number inside the city, or inside the space, and if you remember, we had Alexandria, which is uh, a two. And then we roll a dice. So, I've rolled a five, which means that we have come across uh, guarded treasure. The two from Alexandria plus the five I rolled. And this is Matrix E. Now, if you're playing two player, you will probably just use this Reaction Matrix book, which essentially will uh, give you the paragraph. However, you do have it on your player board as well. So let's look at the player board and then we'll go into the reaction matrix and you can see how it works. So all we do is we go to the E's column. So we've come across this uh, guarded treasure. We can examine it, we can take it, we can use it, open, avoid, sneak, hire help, 
or enter. So those are the options that we can do. I don't know how we enter a guarded treasure. Sometimes you get some silly ones, um, but they do often work. So I have come across a house fire, and one of the options was to drink the house fire. But when I did, it was saying, as you were taking a drink, you came across a house fire. So they do try and fit it in. It is generally quite good. So given that I've got stealth and stealing and quick thinking, I'm going to try and sneak. What the player to your right will do, so your player to your left is in the book, the player to the right has this thing called the reaction matrix, he will look up uh, section E, he'll go across to the line which says guarded, and then go across to the line which says sneak. And this is telling us that the paragraph we need to worry about is 1102. Now the risk with this is that if someone comes across the guarded treasure later on in the game, they will also know exactly what happens with 1102. So to make it a bit more random, we roll something called the destiny dice. And I have a plus, which means it's not 1102, it's actually 1103. So the player to your right will read off the paragraph that you need, you will roll the destiny dice, and then the player back to your left will start to read the paragraph. So, we dip into the book, we need to find 1102, there is a lot in this book. So, obviously, spoiler alert, <laughs> you are about to find out what happens. Um, so, 1102. Okay. So, here we go. Let me just move this along so it's easier for us to have a read of. So, we've got 1,100. Oh, it was 1,103, wasn't it? Okay, so, let's have a little look. So, remember, originally it was 1,102, and then I rolled a plus, which bumped it up to 1,103. So, you plan to rob the infidel temple and begin hiring useful people. One of the men, a disguised infidel, betrays your plans. You are taken captive in a series of bizarre rituals. Your memory of all that has occurred is erased. Destiny won and ensorcelled. That's if I have no skill. If I have this treasure called the Brass Trumpet, then something else happens and I'd actually end up going to paragraph 104. So, unfortunately, uh, Stealth and Stealing did nothing for me uh, and I now have a status. So I never really talked about the uh, the cards, I've just simply set them up over here. So we have uh, a big deck of encounters, a big deck of statuses, a big deck of treasure, and uh, a deck of quests. But anyway, I've just got Destiny 1, so I can bump my Destiny up by 1, and now I've got the status in Sorcelled. So let me just pull down, and then we'll find in Sorcelled for you. So here we have the status in, in Sorcelled. Uh, each turn another player decides where to move your piece. <laughs> so I now no longer have control over my body, someone else is going to be moving me. And it can happen that you can have someone just uh, moving for you and, um, <laughs> and deciding what you do. So you actually don't really get a go in that case, but it's still fun because uh, you actually, uh, <laughs> you can be really sad when bad things happen to you. So, at the end of your turn, you both roll a dice, so I'll roll a dice, and I've rolled a six, and then they'll roll a dice, Ooh, oh, it's gone on the floor, and they've rolled a four, and because I've out-rolled them, I'm no longer in Sorcelled. So that one's actually quite an easy card to get rid of, um, every turn someone will move me around, but it's quite easy to get rid of. Some are very bad. Um, Sex Changed, which I mentioned earlier, is very bad. Uh, probably the worst one is Grief Stricken. Uh, if you have the game, uh, I would house rule <laughs> that you don't get Grief Stricken. Or the first time, you don't, so you get a do-over. That's how we play it in my house. Okay, so we've had our encounter. It would be the end of our go, but because we have this cool city card, we actually get to use the city because we've ended our turn in, in the city. Um, so we simply roll a die, 
okay and it's five and then uh, we would actually in this case encounter the sex change spring okay so I could have gained another skill you can see don't gain destiny sometimes you can gain treasures and stuff like that so these cards are pretty good uh, <laughs> I'm not going to resolve the sex change spring because that's one of the more fun ones for you to see on your own and that's actually it. That's the game. You go round, you score destiny points. So I'm now one tenth of the way to winning on destiny. And obviously zero tenths uh, of the way to winning on story. And you go round and you, you have encounters. The only thing I haven't really covered is the other type of encounter card. So here we have an air do well. Uh, it would be drawn just like the city card was. And uh, you go through, and at dawn, you have an encounter on paragraph 97, it's, uh, midday 92, and dusk uh, 108. Now, in theory, you are supposed to go through the whole deck of encounters, which is sizable. And then once you've gone through the whole deck, you move from dawn to midday which is stupid, because you're not going to. So the way we play it is simply that after you have an encounter, so we have an encounter with the ne'er-do-well at dawn, the next encounter will be at day. And you have these little tokens over here, which will be, uh, they're totally unnecessary, you can just remember, but you can put them and then you'll flick it around and say, now it's daytime and we will have an encounter in the day. Really, that's about it. I mean, you go around the board, you have encounters. The only thing I haven't really mentioned is you can move around uh, pretty much anywhere you like. There are a few special places on the board, and uh, these will not be movable into. So if I move back down to where the ne'er-do-well is, you can see down here we have this thing called the Lake of Colours. And you'll notice that there is an arrow pointing out of the Lake of Colours. Which means I cannot move into it because it's a mythical place. And until I know where it is, I would not be able to find it. In encounters, you will have things that give you access to them. And that's where your destination marker comes in. You can put that on there. And that says, now you can visit the Lake of Colours. And uh, in that case, you don't draw a card. You go to paragraph 179. You're presented with some choices, and then you resolve those choices depending on what you want to do. Um, I love this bit about the game. This is the only bit I really miss in Agents of Smirsh. And they, it could have been done, which is a shame, because they could have easily put in uh, like evil bases and stuff. It's so exciting to go to one of these places because invariably, so my girlfriend was playing this yesterday, um, she went to the Stonehenge and became a sultan and then she went to the Valley of Diamonds and found the biggest diamond in the world. It's just really awesome. They're brilliant, brilliant stories and whenever you get to one, you feel so much pressure. You don't want to screw up. You don't want to miss this opportunity because they are very hard to get to. Um, I've played three games in a row where no one has got to any. They are rare enough that they make you, them stand out. I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever visited the Haunted House. Um, and the Sepulchre of Solomon I think I've been to once. So they're pretty rare, rare things. So you move around, you gain skills, you have adventures. Uh, they're all completely divorced of each other, which is one thing which is probably better uh, with regards to Agents of Smirch. Those stories tend to be the same, or, or follow a, th a theme. Um, and also, just be aware, I, I tried to sneak, didn't I, with my treasure, because I had stealth and stealing. That almost never, ever works in this game, whereas in Agents of Smirsh, if you have a skill that would help you, normally it is called upon to be used. The only other final point I haven't mentioned, the only other rule, is that sometimes you can get the skill again. So let's say I've got quick thinking here, um, and I can flip it over. If I get the skill again, I'm now a master at quick thinking. So this is a talent skill. Uh, where it's brown, and this is a master skill where it's gold. That means that when you get your paragraph, you can look either side and see if quick thinking is needed at any of those uh, junctures. So in that first roll, I got 1,102. If I had been master quick thinking, then uh, the reader would have had to look at 1,101, 1,102, and 1,103 to see if quick thinking was a skill that I might need. And if it was, they would have said, do you want to take the quick thinking one? 
Um, so it gives you that greater chance, and because there wasn't any, then uh, I would have rolled the white dice normally, I got a plus, and then it would have been 1,103 that I used. The only funky rule with that is that some of these skills are mandatory, so you have to use them if you have, uh, otherwise they're optional. Um, and when they are mandatory, they're almost universally bad things. So uh, you can have acting in disguise and be so arrogant with your acting that you, uh, you uh, fudge it and you blow it and you'd be better off with no skill at all. Um, if you've got this gold one, the person reading to you is not allowed to say, oh, there is an option in 1100, but, or 1101, but it's mandatory because then we, you would know it was bad. You just get told, do you want to do it or don't you want to do it? So that's Tales of Arabian Nights. Uh, it's a beautiful game. It's not really a game. It's a beautiful story. Uh, it's my girlfriend's favourite game, uh, which probably makes it my favourite game. There's just so much going on in it. Every story is different. It's uh, brilliant for kids. Um, it's really, really fantastic. It's such an exciting game to play, and I love playing it every time we get it out. Um, if you're thinking about this between this and Agents of Smirsh, Every gamer I've played with has preferred Agents of Smirsh. So um, it's another big ringing endorsement for Jason Maxwell. I don't know. I love both of them, to be honest. I think there's more than enough room in your collection for both of them. If you like the theme of sort of the ancient world, this is going to be better. If you like the theme of spies and you don't mind being cooperative, Agents of Smirsh is going to be better. The reason it's not gone over so well in my family or my household is because my girlfriend is very competitive. She does not like reading bad stories to me that mean bad things will happen to her, which is what happens in Agents of Smirsh. If you lose, everyone loses. In this one, when I get turned into a one-armed snake or something horrible like that, um, she is so happy. <laughs> she's a lovely girl. Uh, she's so happy at all of the terrible things that have befallen me. And that's what the, makes the game a bit more special for us. So that's um, Tales of Arabian Nights. Really fantastic game. I hope, uh, I hope people found this useful.